So the island to the me, my friends, if you look at the very first mountain there. Denis Villeneuve has a grasp on character-driven narratives, small in scope or large in scope. Thanks to the genius of Frank Herbert, here's a story that's on that scale, but with characters and relationships and stories that are dense, you know, and, and, and felt. These were the things that made me want to act. Action. Guess I'm not in the mood today. Mood? What does mood have to do with it? Now fight! Part of what makes Dune so great, it's an incredible cast of characters and an incredible cast of actors. It's very easy to get lost into the concepts, into the scale. But at the end of the day, it's very powerful and complex story. There is no call we do not answer. There is no faith that we betray. Atreides! 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 Dune is the story of the Atreides family that falls into the trap set by the emperor, who is getting more and more jealous of their growing popularity. House Atreides stands as a beacon where every other house in that galaxy is in reference to that, either as enemies or as friends. Oh. What intrigued me about Galito Atreides is the tragic nature of the character. He wants to not only make sure that his people survive, but that his son is the kind of leader that he thinks he should be. Paul Atreides is the son of Duke Leto and Lady Jessica, and he's the future of House Atreides. He's a young man who's facing extraordinary circumstance, trying to navigate it with integrity within the tradition of House Atreides. Friendly make these? Sand compactors and all kinds of ingenious things. What the hell is a sand compactor? That's a sand compactor. <laughs> My God, man, you've gone native. Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho are uh, close allies of Duke Leto. They did feel like big brothers. You know, they rib him, especially Jason. He's the protector of the Atreides. I mean, he's definitely the head knight who watches over the family. Zarkar! I mean, that's his sworn duty. I mean, I think that's what any honorable knight soldier does. Duncan, no! I mean, that's his family. That's who he bleeds for. Gurney Halleck is, is like, is, is a combat trainer. He's a warrior. He's a poet warrior. And he is distrustful of all of it because he is by nature distrustful, like every security guy you ever see who's looking at things that aren't there. Your permission, sire, I must check the integrity of your suit. Oh. He's a very strict, but fun, visceral, paternal, maternal. He's all of those things to Paul. You have to be ready. Paul has all these teachers, and everyone has poured all that they know into this young man. To fear who what? To fear what is a human computer, and I wanted to go away from the cliché of the very cold human being. He had lived and worked with this family for so long that he had really come to have a, a, a dear affection for them. Your mother asked me to check your vitals. Dr. Yue is a trusted member of the family. He has served for the Atreides family for a long time. So, complex and heartbreaking role for an actor to play. If anything happens, will you protect our son? With my life. I'm not asking his mother, I'm asking the Bene Gesserit. Lady Jessica is part of the order of the Bene Gesserit. This order that she's a part of, we can say, would make her perhaps the non-traditional partner to Duke Leto. The congregation that influenced politics from the shadows that have access to all the leaders that are counselors and spies for all the leaders in the world. I'm here, Neil. This group of women who carries enormous strength and powers, they are bodyguards, they are fighters, they can read people. I hold at your neck the gom jaba. One of the strengths that Jessica has is that she's been taught by the Reverend Mother. The Reverend Mother is interested in Paul because there's a prophecy that a member of the Order of the Bene Gesserit will one day uh, give birth to the One, for lack of a better description. And Paul could perhaps be that person. You're lucky he didn't die in that room. Jessica is having to deal with being a mother, a lover, and this Bene Gesserit, and she always has to question which priority comes first. She has her own ambition. It's a very complex, powerful character. How can the Emperor take everything we built and give it to that Duke? 
Every uh, movie needs its, its uh, bad guys, and the Darkonnens are the old, old ancestral enemies of the Atreides. The Darkonnens are a family that have controlled the spice for many generations. Frank Herbert created a very powerful character into Baron Vladimir Arkonnen. Just shows up, and then his shadow looms throughout the film. He's the cause of many people's death. Raban is the nephew of the Baron, and he is a very sadistic and, and mean. Not the smartest guy. <laughs> Raban really wants to please his uncle, and the Baron looks at Raban as more of a pawn, a pawn, and his doesn't really feel much for him. Peter de Vries is the mentat of the Harkonnen family. He's been twisted by the Baron Harkonnen. He's kind of strung Peter out, and Peter is so devoted to this cause of retaining the Harkonnen control of the spice. So squeeze, rather. Squeeze hard. Yes, Uncle. And the vermin. Kill them all. The vermin are native tribes. People living in a deep desert. They had the capacity to adapt to the toughest environment. Deep heat, massive sandstorm, dangerous uh, uh, predators all around. Tilgar is, is the leader of the Fremen. He is a powerful character. He's a warrior, but also he's a warrior. He, he worries about the future. Take good care of your family. Dr. Kynes, on the surface, was seemingly just somebody who's an ecologist, someone who cares about the Fremen. But then you start to understand and how much pressure she is actually under just to keep everything contained and controlled. Who are you to the Fremen? Paul is dreaming about this strange young woman that uh, keeps talking to him in his dreams. Paul. She feels like an old friend again and, and someone that wants to guide him. Don't be frightened. Even a little desert mouse can survive. Johnny is native to Arrakis. She's used to this hostility between her people and the people that are trying to take from her land. She's a fighter at the end of the day. When she does meet Paul, her guard is up. She looks at this person as like, this is a child. But there's clearly something else. There's a glimmer of something between them. I don't believe you're the Lison al Gahib, but I want you to die with honor. It's indescribable what that feeling would be of a proximity of physical attraction in dream form that comes with a terrible purpose. It comes with a very intense actualization. So I think Shani represents all those things to him. And it seems that he truly cares about the people, and there's a deeper humanity within him. They're on a path of conflict, and it's the uh, moral catalyst to Paul's arc towards something greater. Desert power. This is only the beginning. It was a long process because every single little thing had to be designed to try to respect the spirit in the Frank Herbert's book. It's a luxury to have that vision and not so much rely on your imagination. It's pretty great. When the camera lands, look at the camera and say, Neil. Three, two, one, go. Neil. Neil. I think there was an expansiveness to these sets. From an acting perspective, you could just feed off of with ease. It didn't feel like we were shooting on a stage or a studio. I read the script and I can't help it. Images come to mind, like strong images. I create mood boards with references, with little sketches, and I bring them to Denis. So for him, it's important to make this movie his vision. So we try to make something very different from what's been done before. I'm a strong believer that you must build as much as possible because it will influence acting, it will influence the, the imagination of the actors, it will influence myself as a director. Bring this heavy Western. Tons of ideas are being born right on the day on set because the way the light falls, it changes your way to approach reality when you are in a real environment. And done. 
They come from a land in Caladan. It's a bit more cozy. You could almost smell the fireplace going and it's all integrated in nature. For me, Caladan is what we would you know, relate to as a medieval castle. It's also a big contrast with Arrakis. When Paul Atreides lands on Arrakeen, he's uh, confronted to a new kind of architecture that looks nothing like his home. It's designed to resist the worst sandstorm, and uh, the way to deal with heat is like to have like those thick walls and to have like uh, those huge space. Talk about scale. Uh, yes. The size of it needs to be oppressive. And behind us, we have the, the mural of the sandworm. The idea is to have murals that show art that shows their type of culture on the planet. Here, you've got the god figure of the sandworm. Let me take you to um, Paul's bedroom, which is a, a work in progress at the moment. But this is the, uh, the bed. For me, it was important to have this sense of someone who is being squeezed and could be crushed at, at any moment. Patrice Vermet had to be very, very creative with space. The set were like transformers, you know, and you can transform them and change them according to the sequences. This room will play two rooms. It will be Duncan's room, and it's also going to be Leto's room. And right now, we are dressing Leto's room. This is something that Denis and I, we wanted this place to be a bunker. The residency needs to convey the, the feeling of a bunker because the wind on Arrakis, they go at 880 kilometers an hour. So it's natural that they wanted to, to build something that would uh, stand the force of nature. Very little windows or very limited view of windows because they want to protect themselves from the heat. Keep, you know, always the, the coolness of, a, of inside a cave. The furniture and the pieces are so bang on. Just like the shape perfectly fitted for this room. The carpet, you know, without that carpet, the room, you know, it's just a plain floor. The carpets were made in Denmark by this amazing company that, that, that digitally print onto carpet. It was a local company here in Budapest that we went through. So they're real carpets and then we aged them down as well. It really helps give a cultural aspect to the space. The production design is futuristic, but it's ancient to go wander through those places. I've learned so much on this. It's a beautiful thing. The detail, the art department, hands up to them. It's just exquisite, the work that they've done. It's like doing one of those biblical cinemascope Technicolor films from back in the day. Action. We're in Kind's lab, which is basically a research centre where they're basically trying to get life on Arrakis. So it's about how you grow things in sand or with lack of moisture. Looked at scientific equipment, weird stuff, and, and also then just tried to link it in with a, a reality, like that's the equivalent of a grow light. Denny didn't want anything that looked remotely like it was from a lab that he recognized. The guys are working at the studio for us, made everything. This is just one room, and it's uh, based, I saw early on in my research, Second World War bunkers. It was like a one main corridor and multiple circular chambers around. It's an ancient lab, and in the main office, there are ancient writing, but if you look at the, in the texture, I wanted to have some writing that almost is camouflage in the texture of the rock. So it's the layers of the past, it's the knowledge from this planet, and it represents the culture that has been invaded by the, the empires. It was a tremendous amount of work that was made by Patrice and his team. We worked very hard to create something that has not been seen before, which is not easy. It's very smooth working with Denis. We have the same love for filmmaking. We agree on, on aesthetics. He's a passionate man. To be invited to work on a movie like this is beyond any dreams. So, um, yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Dune took 
years to be made because it was a challenge to respect the spirit of Frank Herbert's book and bring it to the big screen. Maybe the most important thing of all, I wanted the design to be inspired by nature. The light, the wind, the dust, to feel that these worlds, these were real natural environments. Frank's book, as a world builder, he's, he created this, this whole epic. Because I knew Denis really wanted to honor the book, so I would sort of triangulate between Denis' words, Frank's passages, and try to inform how to go forward with my designs. I read in Frank's words in his passages that there was 200 mile an hour winds, and everything was really designed to deal with this brutal environment of Arrakis. It's almost like solving a puzzle, how to make those into something you've never seen before in a movie. What I would do is, is just deal with very simple shapes, and maybe just a little detail on the side, just to give you a sense of scale. That was very interesting in terms of trying to design something that made sense. When Paul Atreides lands on Arakin, he's confronted to a new planet. A planet, the most converted and most dangerous planet in the galaxy. From a color perspective, Denis wanted Arrakis to be harsh and desolate. It's everything that's on Arrakis is all like stone, brown, sand color. In the past, I shot in Jordan, and I remember 10 years ago saying to myself, wow, if ever the day I make a movie like Dune, that's where I'm coming. There are unique, fantastic rock formations that look like from another world. Look what we discovered on lunch break. I've never seen a desert like that. Never, I'm a rock climber. I've never seen rock like that. The light is absolutely unique in that place the surroundings, the color of the soil, the sky. It feels like there's very much a spirituality that exists there. When you're on Arrakis, it's, it's a hot, desert, arid environment. So it's a very, very strong light, and, it, and it's something you can't reproduce in the studio. Arrakeen is actually based on an actual area in Wadi Rum. It was scouted by a helicopter, and we found this area where, like, it was, it's uh, surrounded by mountains. We would previs um, certain moves going into Arakeen. We did rough geometry of the, the area, and then, like, a, we created a rough flight path. So the city itself needed to be a monument. We wanted to tell a story with that. This is a city that needed to feel like it was populated and that there were native Arakeen citizens going about their daily lives within it. The city itself as a character was very important to Denis. We had an opportunity to let him design his own cameras to fly over the city. And we were able to build a low resolution version of the city, place it on an iPad for him to walk around and be able to design his own camera angle uh, as if he was shooting it live action from a helicopter. City elements were shot in Budapest. The sound stage with like two football fields. We recreated a gigantic tarmac for the Atreides landing. So that for the set extension to create a studio, we had to use sand screens. We found when you put the sand screen in the negative, it becomes blue. So it's an inverted blue screen. It works really well for when you're out in the desert as well, because you just invert it and you're already in that color. We're good to go. Dune is a movie about nature. It was very important for me to be as close as possible with nature itself. The desert gave us a lot. We captured it with the cameras, and I'm very proud of what we brought back from there. decision to make Dune, and you go back home, the first thing you say to yourself is, what about the worms? 
which is the big challenge. The sandworm is one of the most iconic things about Dune. The sandworms are responsible for the spice. We have to believe that these are real creatures, and in the case of the way the Fremen view them, almost godlike. With the Fremen, it's not just a sandworm. This is a sacred creature that represents the Earth creation, the cycle of life, and also a power that is way beyond them. A sandworm is a massive creature that can be like more than 500 meters long that goes in the deep desert, and they are a territorial beast, and they want to protect the spice fields. It's a phenomenal animal, and there had been a lot of reproduction imagery that came through the years in books and art. It's a very famous beast. The largest and most dangerous organism on Arrakis is the sandworm, known to the Fremen as Shai Hulud. We try to approach the worm with the same concerns that Frank Herbert wrote and created the worm, which is like a uh, biology. How this creature has been transformed and how this creature adapted to this environment and how it feeds, how it hunts, how it moves, how it behaves. And so to create these giant sandworms and have them not look like some Hollywood CG machination, but to have them feel like real organic creatures that you believe could have this kind of presence was a huge task. It's here! It all came from that kind of feeling that the worm will need to look like a survivor through the ages and that it will have that kind of prehistoric quality, that it will have that those kind of scales and that kind of very rough skin that has been grinded by the sand through centuries, you know? Bless the maker and his water. And also the idea that the worm will need to feed himself through sand krill like microorganism in the sand, so it can filter the sand and get his food out of it like a whale. May his passage cleanse the world and keep the world for his people. The sandworm was unique in that we were concentrating on the mechanics of the movement. We studied real world desert camouflage creatures to understand how they would interact with their own environments and we tried to apply some of those lessons to how these sandworms might function. We had to work very closely with our visual effects vendors to understand how sand might propagate if a giant creature is pushing its way through folding sand dunes. Does sand collapse in the vacuum behind it or does it maintain as a mound above it? And we had to spend months understanding how a worm of that size would move through a huge field of sand and find the balance between the artistic goals and what the real world mechanics might be. There's a unique moment in the film when we finally see the sandworm in its fullest form. We instinctually began that sound design process to create a massive, frightening beast. Denis made very clear to us early on that that was a moment of reverence for a beautiful being. And Theo and I very quickly had to disavow ourselves of that reflex of the Godzilla scream, for lack of a better term, you know. That's the moment where we decided if there's a silent contemplation between the two of them, then we have something very unusual. It's not a monster breaching out of the soil. It's a meeting with God. The initial sounds that you hear are the actual physical artifacts of its being. The orifice, the maw, if you will, it looks like thousands of sinewy tendrils inside the mouth. We created a sound for that what looks like a throat closing mechanism and you hear the physicality of that. And it isn't until near the very end of the sequence where you actually hear what we would call the voice of the worm, but it's nothing like what you would expect. It's a moment of very simple communication. We also found that there was a connection between the sound that the worm makes with its throat, a kind of glunk glunk sound, the sound that the Fremen have been using to attract the worm. So we thought perhaps that suggests that the reason that worms are attracted to that sound is because it sounds like worm communication. It's a thumper. All creatures on the Earth, including humans, are a byproduct of their physical environment where those sounds begin to fuse and become one. One thing I know is that we did it. <laughs> I think that Frank Herbert will appreciate that version of the worm that, at the end of the day, 
needs to be a very frightening, impressive creatures, and at the same time, an incarnation of God. So it needs to have that kind of a ah quality. character of the Baron is a very small role, but if you gave him enough physicality, you could create such a strong presence that he would sort of cast a shadow over the entire film, which is necessary for a bad guy. I said that you could join her. So join her. I needed an actor with that gravitas, with that range, that would be able to bring the deep intelligence of the Baron and the cruelty and I will say right from the start that as much Stenen is the loveliest guy, still I'm frightened of him. <laughs> He's very frightening. When is a gift not a gift? He's not only very gracious, but I can tell that he's a hard worker because of the makeup that he's had to put up with and <laughs> go through and still be able to perform. He is so imposing in his makeup and his look. The first time I saw him in his look was the first time I met him. And I was like, oh my God. It's incredible. If the Duke's son lives, now our trade is will live. His performance is what makes that transformation believable. So it's done, finally. We did a tremendous amount of, of research and design in order to find that shape that will define the Baron. I had long discussions with Denis about where I wanted to go with it, and that he looked different, that he had a presence that you hadn't seen before. I didn't want the Baron to look like a caricature. I wanted a strength and power, and I wanted to feel a menace. One of the first decisions I made about the Baron is that we will not use a CGI, but the prosthetics. Because I wanted the actor to be in relationship directly with the character. It's a huge undertaking. I spoke to Denis about it and said, you know, Louve and Eva, and the makeup designers in Sweden, would be my choice to create this. And Stellan was very happy with the idea. Thankfully, they're living in Sweden. And we started doing tests very early on. And they're fantastic. They're some of the best special effect makeup people in the world. We took Stellan in for live cast, and we did a full body live cast. And we started doing a sculpt of the entire character. If you have the full makeup, it's seven hours. And it's physically hard. Mentally, I can't do it because it's fun watching them work. So the first thing is in the morning, he puts the cooling suit on. And then we pull this neck on top of him. It's like a big donut piece that goes on top. And after that, we put this headpiece. The big thing is, of course, the change of the face and the shoulders and all that. That is very, very delicate. I mean, normally, um... Uh, the stuntman doesn't wear it more than one hour. No, I, I can yeah. easily do two because I'm not a sissy. Yeah, he's uh, a real man. Yeah. <laughs> and then we put on his undersuit. Yeah, this is the fun part. <laughs> and then you have the fat skin on, and then the edges between the skin and your fake hands and your fake head has to be hand painted in, and it's a very complicated process. Seven hours later. A lifetime. It required a lot of patience from Stellan, and uh, I'm still grateful that Stellan didn't complain. <laughs> okay, sure, no, no problem. And I've never seen his demeanor be anything other than pleasant and gracious, and that says a lot because I know from wearing makeup in the past that it's just not a comfortable thing. <laughs> That's very good. And I also think that he does enjoy it. Yeah. He, he does enjoy becoming the Baron. It was mesmerizing to see the Baron come to life. He was quite frightening. Tonight the house of a trade is full, and your bloodline ends forever. You can produce the nicest makeup and the most beautiful pieces, but if you don't have an actor that can act in what we do, then it's all for nothing. It's really the actor that makes the makeup become 
something that is alive. Fremen. <sighs> Kill them all. Stellan is so possessed by the darkness of the Baron. Yeah, fantastic performance. You don't feel wonderful all the time when you're out, but then suddenly something happens, often with another actor, and it swings, and it's music. Yeah. And then, oh, this is what I live for. When I decided to do Dune, I wanted really to create a new soundscape because those sounds cannot be have been heard before. What makes this film unique is the total bravery, recklessness, and talent Denis had for this project. A lot of it is being an audience member. You sit there in a theater and you watch it, you go, what would I really like to hear? Denis is a very progressive director he sees the value in sound being part of the whole filmmaking process. Because in Dune, rhythm is everything. Rhythm is life, and rhythm, most important, can be death. Usually sound is in what's called post-production, but Denis recognizes the value of developing the soundscape as he's shooting the film and as Joe Walker, the editor, is developing the cut. So I was collaborating while we were filming. The sounds of the worm chase. The sounds of the ornithopters. All these were being developed in tandem with the filming process. And I wanted as an editor to be able to build that sound world into this film right from the outset and build, bake it in to the cut. you approach it in that way and you're understanding his story and what he's going for, I mean, that's what we try to do with sound. You're not doing the normal stuff. You're, you're really going after mood and character development, things like that, that would make that come alive. If you want it, make me give it to you. Use the voice. I think the voice was a big challenge because it had to sound like a real thing. It had to sound natural and not like a synthesizer right. effect. We came up with this idea of summoning the voices of their ancestors, which would be brought out as he tried to summon his own voice. Give me the water. It was almost a ghostly voice that could be an ancestral voice of the Bene Gesserit that um, Paul Atreides would be able to tune into as he grows and evolves and experiences spice. But I don't think we ever fully felt comfortable with it till maybe the last few days of the sound mix. We were in process for the longest period of time on creating the voice. Dune is all about the sand, and I felt straight away, we're not gonna be asking a Foley stage to record this. So the first thing I tried doing was sticking a, a microphone underneath the sand and walk around it. And I realized that a sand dune is a resonant body. You can hear someone walking 100 meters away. So we then returned to the desert later right. and made a whole bunch of recordings together. Yeah, we spent an entire day in the desert Theo, in those, those early experiments, had captured what we found was a, a really novel sound that most people aren't aware of, and that is, is that sand itself in large masses at the right humidity and temperature makes these beautiful whale-like groans. And it m almost makes the desert like it's its own character because it has a voice, and we wanted to bring those kinds of sounds to the movie. So it's really about what does the film need? And that has to be on the top, you know, that, that carries the day. So if you are telling the story, the film should tell you what it needs. Sometimes it's tempting to be flashy with sound. Sometimes it's tempting to make a spaceship the loudest, most powerful one you've ever heard. Our aim was to make it feel as if we had really been there and recorded it as if a, a documentary crew had a really good sound recordist. 
to make the world as realistic as possible. We can't go and record an ornithopter. We can't go and record a worm. So we have to design those things, and that brings an aesthetic to the film. It brings um, a tone to the film, and the tone that we were going for was realism. That's a tall order for us, to create this fake reality. It was always trying to kind of balance sound design and music. You don't really know where one ends and the other begins in this film. I was in need of a composer. I asked Hans Zimmer if he knew Dune, the book, and Hans answered was that it was a, probably one of his favorite book of all time. It was one of his biggest dream to score Dune. So his answer was a big yes. It was always more about the conversation because I knew the book so well. He knew the book so well. We knew our subject. So now it was figuring out how we were going to interpret something that we truly loved and admired. Hans was experimenting and he did, did tons of experiments, tons of experiments. He, he created even instruments. He wanted really to put himself in danger trying to define a new uh, musical language. Whenever we came across science fiction movies, you'd hear overtly Western instruments, trumpets blaring away and strings, and you go, you know, did this culture really just do what our culture did and build violins and oboes? What's a French horn on Arrakis? And then ended up spending forever making sounds, making instruments, getting people to learn how to play instruments in a different way always bringing new ideas to how to compose music. You know, we feel that everything's been done, but that's not the case. He kept saying to me, those sounds cannot be heard before. And so he created new instruments, a new musical language. All the, the score inspired by the sound of the wind and the sound of the wind on the sand and the rhythm too, because the rhythm attracts the worm. There's a rhythm that keeps recurring in the movie, and that is truly not playable by human beings. But, but because it keeps recurring, it, it doesn't, it's not random. Do, do you know what I mean? It's designed, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. You know, it's not supposed to make sense. And it was recording a person in a way that you can't normally record them, then treating each syllable separately and differently. One of the things I love about Hans is that he's part of a long line of German, Austrian composers, and the way that they work of building the smallest organic unit, little cell that could develop into a whole two and a half hour score. You know, the book is about these houses and it's just about royalty and it's about an emperor, it's about where do we come from and where do we go? And it's really just a ginormous watch interlocking with interlocking parts. And so I thought that all the motifs should be able to stand on their own two feet, but they should all be able to interlock and create one giant forward motion machine in a way. Not just a sonic world, but a thematic world. So and he's looking for a piece of music that could be used in any context. It could be slowed down, it could be a, a romantic version of the theme, it can be a, a, a tension version of the theme. It was kind of really magical to see his process. Part of what I love about the score is how unfamiliar it is. What he did, especially with the voice and understanding sort of where the voice comes from and the ancestors and these different cultures and the blending of these different worlds, it's incredibly exotic, it's emotional, it's intense. It is wholly original and very specific to the film. Okay, let's try, let's try one, okay? One, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you. 
the one thing that we felt would be true through any culture would be the voice. We developed our own language and then made those poor singers do truly impossible things. Keeping my spot is the hard part. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. But luckily, Loa Kotler is one of our singers, the great Lisa Gerard, you know, S Susie Waters. They're extraordinary perfectionists. When you throw the impossible at them, that's when they get excited. If you surround yourself with incredibly brave, reckless and talented people, they'll lead you into new directions automatically. I always know we're on the right path when somebody goes, this might be the worst idea you've ever heard. I think it's one of the best scores that Hans has ever written. It makes you feel something in different ways that you know a more traditional score would fail to do. I want the audience to come with us on this journey to this planet and to this world, which seems huge and vast and fathomable, and then at the same time realize that it's all about the smallest and tiniest emotion, just like the desert is made up of grains of sand, and the music is just made up of grains of notes. And so rather than it being a massive blanket of sound, this is different. This is moving emotion.